Welcome to What's Wrong with Wolfie. And welcome to What's Wrong with Wolfie, a retro podcast dedicated to the pop culture of the 80s, 90s, and zeros. My name is Jason, and this was not going to be the plan to kick us off returning to our regular schedule, but it's been a turbulent time in our personal lives with one thing or another hitting all at once, but I still managed to get a great interview recorded for you with Ben Baker joining us. He is a self-published author of many nostalgia-based books based on the 80s and 90s, with Ben's latest book, The Dreams We Had as Children, which released in December 2023, is all on CITV's history and Ben's personal top 40 shows. Ben was feeling slightly under the weather when he talked to me, and you may notice that during the interview, but Ben was determined to talk to us and we had already rescheduled a couple of times. You're about to hear us have a lovely little conversation on his books, Children's CITV, the state of modern TV, me grilling him on five shows he admitted from his list that should have been there, and his radio show Ben hosts on Noisebox Radio. But before we welcome Ben, I just wanted to remind you all of a few things. Firstly, we are a fan-supported show, and if you'd like to throw us a quid or two, then coffee is the place to go. But if that's not right for you right now, then you can support us for free by giving us a five-star review or rating on your podcast platform of choice. I just want to thank everyone who has left us a review or rating, and also to the person who recently gave us a five-star rating on Spotify. Really, really appreciate it. So thank you all very, very much. I also just like to mention our Discord, where you can come and be a part of a small community to discuss pretty much anything pop culture related, or just to share what's going on in your day. You can find links for our coffee or Discord in the show notes or on our website at thewolfypod.com. If you do visit the website, you might notice a couple of reviews by Matt Murray. He's reviewed Raku Venture and Hidden in Time 2 for us, and they are certainly worth checking out. Really grateful to Matt for writing these, and hopefully there will be more to come from him in the future. You'll also see a review for Electrician Simulator from my good self, so it'd be great if you could give that a look too. Now with all that out of the way, let's get on to the interview with Ben. Hey, I'm here with Ben Baker, author of his new book, The Dreams We Had as Children. Ben, welcome to the Wolfie Pod. Uh, hello. Uh, finally glad to be here after yes. several uh, attempts and fails, uh, but mainly because my body has decided to just completely give up on me. I'm, 40, I'm 43 now, that's it. <laughs> I know, right? As soon as you get put, everyone says that life begins at 40, but I mean, I, don't, I didn't believe them. I, I would say the, the mental wherewithal is better when you're in your forties. Uh, it's just all the physical things <laughs> that yeah. are attached. It's like, no, no, I've had enough. Can't deal with it anymore. Uh, which is a lovely, uh, positive start for a early <laughs> interview. I apologize. But I think like the majority of the listeners that are probably are listening can probably relate quite well. So they're probably just sitting there or, or driving, just nodding their heads in agreement at us. So. <laughs> Rubbing creams into their uh, yeah, ankles exactly. and thighs. Yeah. Yeah. No, we totally get it. And we're, we, we, we are you, you are us. And, uh, I think, I think like, um, thinking back of all the guests that we've had on the podcast, I think you're probably the most Northern that we've had. So, um, you can walk away with high praise with that. Yeah, that's fair. I, I, I must admit, I, I, I've I've seen some of the guests you have, and I can't think of anyone more northern. Uh, definitely no. Uh, but th- that that's fine. I mean, the thing is, I'm in West Yorkshire, so where I am, I don't feel very Yorkshire. But then mm-hmm. I speak to people, and they go, "Wow, you're very Yorkshire." So I don't know. I mean, obviously, the first time I've I've sp- spoken to you, like personally, um, so I'm kind of waiting to hear to see if we get some of the proper uh, northern but vocab. From your good self, so uh, but, <laughs> I, I'm sadly I've left me a uh, fettling whip it outside, but uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll give it a go. We'll throw our mum on fire. Let's see how we go. Okay, all right. But I mean, the big reason that uh, I've got you here uh, onto the podcast is um, you know you're an author, 
and uh, you're, uh, you're I thought you said orphan then for a second I'm like <laughs> bloody hell that's no way to break it to me <laughs> so I genuinely thought you said orphan for a second I'm like I don't what? oh yeah yeah no I am I am an orphan yes <laughs> Oh God, we're, we're going to have problems here with like the Northern and the and the Essex, the Northern and the Essex dialect going on here. No, no, it's just my <laughs> ears, my old person's <laughs> ears. That's all. Uh, yeah. No, I uh, I am not an orphan, and I am an author. <laughs> yes, a self-published author, and uh, I mean, you've just released a new book only uh, last month in December, mm-hmm. uh, the dreams that we had as children, a CITV book, and um, obviously I want to get into that a little bit later on in the interview. You know, I think it's quite important for, for the listeners just to know a little bit about yourself in general, really. You know, is it just books that you do? In regards to to how I spend my days, more doing podcasts and radio, really. Uh, I'm part of a station called Noisebox Radio, and I do two shows a week at the moment on there, uh, which is, is, is quite a lot of work. Uh, and I'm st- I've just started a new podcast, which I can't actually say what it is yet because it's not out yet. Uh, but with with my friend John, we are doing a ri- very ridiculous podcast. So suddenly, I'm doing all the aud- after doing all the writing. It's like and then I stop that for a bit, and then it's now onto the audio cycle. And then I'll probably get bored of that in a couple of months, and I'll start thinking, "Oh, I might write a book again." You know, I'm like, oh. <laughs> it keeps it fresh. It keeps it fresh. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to make this what you know my living. It's it's getting there. It's not it's not there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is what I think about podcasting. I love doing podcasting, but and, uh, it's something I'd love to do as a full time job, or you know, at least a, a job that brought in some money. <laughs> but um, you know, it's a hobby, so you know, and, and I'm happy with that. So when when did you? St- when was your first ever podcast out of interest? Oh God, um, it was it was a podcast that I used to do with one of my uh, friends that I grew up with. 2015, maybe around that time, I did my first one. See, the first time I put audio for download before the word podcast was uh, actually uh, used was 2002. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I used to do sketch shows and stuff and put them up. And because of the times, it was like you could you could put them in as high quality as 128K, uh, which <laughs> uh, was, was like, that'd be like five minutes download. You can have the 32K version, which genuinely we may have just recorded on potato peel and mud because yeah. it sounded that bloody awful. But <laughs> again, you just sort of went with what the internet was and we just progressed ever since. Yeah. And yeah, sort of like the word podcast sort of about 2005, I think people started using that one. And yeah, back then, wasn't it? There was a time where basically I had a, well, I had a podcast which would always get in the iTunes comedy top 10 because there wasn't that much stuff out there. Yeah. And the reason I sort of asked why you, when you started is because again, you, you, even from 2015, you've seen like the explosion and all these people getting involved who wouldn't have gone near a podcast. wouldn't even heard of a podcast like five years before. It should be good, but it's frustrating. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's great that we have this platform where anybody can just sit down and create something out of nothing i guess through yeah. through the power of audio um but and that and that's a great thing obviously but um you know when when it's so accessible now um mm. and there's so much of it it is just very hard on the discoverability side it, it is certainly when you're competing with star names who have production teams yeah. you know and star celebrity guests and stuff i mean you've you've had some cracking guests on this show uh, okay. but I'm sorry to ruin that for you, but you know, <laughs> you've put the time in, you've put the effort in, you've committed to doing it. And I think certainly like I've done quite a few podcasts, well, a few, I've done about eight podcasts to promote this book. And I only pick things that just interested me because it's like, not that I was getting like Graham Norton or anything, but you know what I mean? It's like, there were certain shows like, no, that doesn't sound much fun. You know, it's like, and shows like yours like oh yeah they get it i think that's the important thing for mm. it's like uh i look for podcasts these days of people who if they're not like super expert on something that's fine but they're passionate about it mm. i think passion is the most important thing with podcasting and radio yeah definitely 100 percent. if you haven't got the passion then it doesn't it, def- it definitely shows through the stuff that mm. you're putting out i think so but you mentioned there about noise box radio um and mm. you know quite intrigued about what you got you what you do on there and 
like how you got involved with Noisebox? Uh, Noisebox has be two years old this March. And it basically started uh, because I became friends with some people who were presenters on another station. They decided to try their own thing and asked me from the get-go, you know, do you fancy doing this? Because they'd heard my podcasts, which I've been, as I've been doing for years on and off. So in that respect, it's it's great because it's like a community radio station, but the community is the world you know mm. which can sound a bit wanky i appreciate but it's we've got we've got someone from every con of of the uk pretty much uh just by uh, sheer coincidence and chance and what have you and yeah again, again like podcast it's been hard to get the word out because there are so many radio stations now and as is anyone can start an internet radio station but you know we're doing it legit you know we pay as prs and all that sort of stuff so i'm um, not only do we you know play a lot of older music which you know we go back up to the sort of 50s i mean it's predominantly 70s 80s 90s really is what we play on their sort of most days with a bit of 2000s. But we play a lot of new stuff as well. We play not only sort of new songs by established artists, but new stuff as well. It's just we're always playing new music and it's made us, as, a, as you know, people of a certain age, take the time and take the effort to actually listen to new music and go, oh, yeah, it, it, it didn't die in 1998 or, <laughs> yeah. you know, the thing. And... It's just it's a, it's a big market for grabbing people's attention, but we have some fantastic programs and some fantastic uh, presenters. Definitely, like genuinely, is uh, is the station I turn on in the morning. It's it's, it's only partly ruined by having my voice on it. Really, it's, you know. It's, <laughs> well, I I I I recorded most of the uh, jingles and stuff like that. So you, you, if you tune in, you will hear this terrible voice a lot. Although slightly less, uh, hopefully, lurgy filled. You know, I've listened to some of these internet radios beforehand, and you know they've been all right for 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 a while, and then I kind of lose interest and move along with the day. But um, I did check out Noisebox, and uh, I was pleasantly surprised with the kind of music that was being played, okay. and, and and the um, personalities of the of the DJs really came out quite nicely. I, I'm, yeah. I'm glad you said that, definitely, because. We have had people approach us and go, here's a demo, and it sounds fine, but they're just not really saying anything. There's no, like, I get his passion. There's no passion in there. They're, like, going, hello, this is a program which could be on literally any local radio station ever. I mean, we're always looking for new presenters, which is a great thing. And I always say, like, what's your thing? Or as Lemmy says, what's your hang? Uh, is basically, you know, what's your passion? What's your genre? What's your era? Mm. Sort of thing. And we'll work out a show from there, basically. I, I think, again, I'm going to keep coming back to it. It's like, if you are... Like, we we have a show called, wait for it, The Funk and Soul Show, which plays, yes, <laughs> Funk and Soul. I love that show, but it's mm. not a show I could put together. That's not something my obsession lies. I do the indie show. I play mm. weird stuff, you know. And, and loud, noisy things. And I think that's it. If you have enough people who are doing what they what they love, I guess, is, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an important thing, I would say. And I'm glad you've said the personality shine through, and I am just waffling now because I, I genuinely <laughs> have drunk the Kool-Aid full, fully. I don't know, like, you listen to commercial radio, and, like, yeah, there, there are a couple of DJs that, you know, they stand out from the crowd. Yeah. But for the majority, you know, they're just a radio DJ doing yeah. radio dj stuff whereas yeah. you know like you like you mentioned you've you've got different people doing different things and they all got their own different thing it just it just really shines through oh cheers i appreciate that. i just say uh, it, it's 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 sort of mostly music during the day and then sort of the program starts sort of 8 p.m and uh yeah we just sort of again it's like we have a fantastic 80s show which plays some stuff you know, but quite a lot that you'd like you don't know. But again, in a kind of oh, that's interesting. We have what else? We've got a brilliant rock show. We've got uh, a, we've got a guy called uh, Kia who basically plays 
if I say it's world music, your brain instantly goes to a very sort of Andy Kershaw kind of uh, mm-hmm. Bundu Boys kind of thing, but it basically plays music from anywhere in the world other than English speaking countries. And it's brilliant. It's just fascinating. And again, he that's his passion. He loves finding weird records from around the world and playing them. And I was like, it's not a show I could do. Mm. Uh, or uh, it was not a show I could do to an inch of the quality that Keir does it, for example. And so, yeah, I think the problem a lot with with actual radio, certainly with local radio, with all of its cuts last year, mm. sort of thing, the taking away choice, you know, replacing it with, I'm not saying nothing, but certainly least offensive porridge, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. yeah. The jer- the, I mean, it's one of, I mean, I always used to listen to Heart or when it used to be Essex FM, you know, the local radio station yeah, before yeah, I got yeah. took, took over by heart. Uh, I, I stopped listening after hearing Summer of 69 for the seventh time that day and then uh, the song from Dirty Dancing for f- the fourth time that day and then Footloose and uh, what, whatever else was on repeat. Yeah, um, I can't I can't do it anymore. I just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put Greatest Hits Radio on in the morning for Popmaster. And that's it. That's my limit. And yeah. he always play it for some reason. I don't know why, but it seems that every other day he plays Walk of Life, <laughs> either before or after. And I cannot bloody stand that record. <laughs> but it's perfectly representative of. I suspect most of the country are very happy mm. with that. They yeah. go, "Oh yeah, I love to hear this." Me, I like a bit more of a mixture. I like. I like. Yeah. I'm quite happy to hear obvious of them. We play like you know loads of. It's what you would call obvious acts and stuff like that. But you might hear some, like, we'll play Pet Shop Boys, we'll play ABBA, mm. you know, we'll play Nirvana, we'll play all sorts and stuff, but it might not be necessarily West End Girls, Dancing Queen, or Smells Like Teen Spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll get a different single. Certainly like bands like uh, Madness. I mean, we, we've often joked, because we sort of have things uh, in sort of pre-80s, 80s, 90s, noughties, and sort of current and there is possibility with some bands like madness that you, they could come out for every era yeah. you know yeah uh, cuz they do have songs in all those times it's like it's not happened yet but it could do yeah no i like what you said there you know like you you'll play the bands that people know but you may not necessarily play that song that gets played all the time you'll play something yeah. else from their library um, it's just nice it keeps it fresh uh, you know you're not hearing the same song yeah. over and over again well i mean i, I mean i I absolutely agree. We the head of music, Steve Binney, he's, he's on it sort of thing. And it's again, it is such a small thing. There is three of us basically sort of on top of everything and presenters sort of chip in where they can sort of thing. Because it's a volunteer thing, obviously. Mm. And, you know, you, you have to have people want to, to do it. So you have to sort of not be a knob, I think. is <laughs> Yeah. I guess that helps, I guess, that, you you know, it is voluntary. So, you know, mm. it keeps the knobs yeah. away, maybe. Uh, mm. <laughs> no comment. No comment. No, he does. He does. <laughs> he does. We, honestly, the team we've got currently, we've we've had a few, one or two have not fit in, but generally everyone else has, yeah, totally just got it. Yeah. Just, just the, my, my, my tagline for it and uh, for the radio station, I always been, it's, Pop music for adults, but not necessarily grown-ups, as I think there's an important distinction there. Pop kids who became pop adults, basically, you know, like, why why because I'm 43 should I stop listening to, to pop music? Exactly. Your show in particular, before we move on to your books, like, what would people expect to hear from, from your show on Noisebox? Well, I'm doing two at the moment, because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> So on Tuesdays, 8pm, I do middle-aged teenage angst, which, again, is playing very much into that, you know, why should teenage kicks be only for teenagers? We, we you know, we we want to get up and dance to indie and alternative songs. Just let us have a sit-down every, like, so, like, 10 minutes or so. We'll be fine. And, yeah, I'm kind of playing old and new indie and alternative stuff. It's, you know, it's not rocket surgery, but I enjoy it. It's That's where my uh, passion lies. And the other one is Sundays, uh, 7 till 9. Uh, it's a live show I do called Songs of Reappraise. 
And basically, I'm playing songs that you just wouldn't hear anywhere else, or you'd probably not hear on many radio stations. I mean, I played the Jim Bowen rap last week, an actual single which came <laughs> out in 1991 by Jim Bowen. And no stuff. way. But, yeah. That's but brilliant. it's not all novelties. It's like I try to play songs that are really good that you just don't yeah. hear. You know, but for example, like like Queen, on the radio, you're going to hear three songs. You, it's nearly always Don't Stop Me Now. You you might get booming rhapsody, you know. You might get, I don't. Uh, we are the champions, you know. It's, there's not a lot of range. You'd not get mm. now. I'm here, or uh, body language. Uh, that sort of thing. It's like there's uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of room to play in that. Terms. And yeah, I have fun sort of uh, throwing things at people and going like. And they're going, what is this? What What is this? And then, and then the next one, will be like, oh, this is brilliant. I haven't heard this radio. So it's kind of like spinning those plates between absolute nonsense and uh, absolute brilliance, I guess. Yeah. Quite gutted. I missed the Jim Bowen rap, actually, I'm really, to be honest. Well, you know, the, it, is, it is on Mixcloud, mixcloud.com slash noisebox radio. You can hear that again. Uh, I mean, last week I also had... Uh, uh, it's the theme to the greatest American hero. Don't you remember that? A bit of Blondie, a bit of, like Chris Rea's good song, Auberge. You know, you don't hear that anywhere. Mm. Uh, Tasman Archer covering Elvis Costello, The Scaffold. Uh, Julian Clary covering Wandering Star, which genuinely quite, quite beautiful. Mm. <laughs> you wouldn't expect it, but yeah. So that, that's, yeah, it's kind of where my passions lie. Yeah, that's kind of uh, the general gist with that. So if people want to listen, uh, they can get involved. As I said, they can come join the Noisebox Discord and uh, chat along and rate some of the songs and all that. And Yeah, got a little guest chart every week from this week in chart history of all flops, which didn't make it in. And people can choose which one they wish to hold aloft, like they, uh, that the lost trophy it is. Or is that just bollocks? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that sounds great. And yeah, people could go to what noisebox.com to, to get that. Noisebox.radio.com, yeah. Um, okay, well, let's leave the radio station there and let's it's get... Gone. It's, it's, in, it's, it's gone. In, it's gone. It's, it's in the far distance. I'm waving <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye, Noisebox. I'll see you later. I'll 50 pence for uh, <laughs> what meter. Yeah. Um, and let, let's talk a little bit about your writing because... Um, if it must. That, that's what you hear... For the, well, that's what I got you here for. Because I'm an orphan. Yes, things. we've established. Yes. <laughs> before we before we get into the into the books, like, well, what inspired you to write in the first place? For all my entire life, I've always been like, if there's a scrap of paper as a kid, I'd be scribbling stuff down. You know, just writing. I, I think I, ideally, I've often said this: if I could swap writing for being a good artist, I would have done because art. You know, being a bit like for, I'd look. I'm a big fan of comic books and stuff like that. So I would have loved to have been a good artist, but I am not. And the thing is, I've tried to write sort of not serious books, but certainly books with less of a voice. And I found that the, not, there was less interest in those. And so books like like the one I've I've just brought out and I've several sort of Christmas themed ones I did. I've tried to write as me as just a bloke. You know, I'm a 43-year-old bloke and I'm just remembering some of this stuff. I'm revisiting some of this stuff and sort of working out my own path through, I guess. I've, I think the in terms of writing and, like, why I write is just to get out of my head, I think. It's sometimes it's like if something's itching you, you just, you just got to write it down. I say that to my wife, you know, when she starts stressing about all the stuff we're going to do in the house, I say, just write a list. Just mm. write it out of your brain onto a piece of paper. And she always feels better for it afterwards. Yeah, well, there's there's, there's two reasons. Like, one is, like, proactive things are always... A, they're so hard to see when you're doing a proactive thing. Also, to celebrate yourself and go, I did a good thing there. Two, it's just distraction. <laughs> you know, it really is. You st- when you focus in on one thing, you're not focusing on another which is sometimes how i write can be a bit sort of monomaniacal really when it comes to it's just that it's all that this last book in particular was like three months of whirling dervish which not healthy (laughs) i'm quite happy to admit that now but yeah 
that's the problem with having an idea for a book in September and thinking, oh, that would tie in really well with uh, the anniversary in uh, the start of January. Guess I better write it then. <laughs> so the book that you released in December, you started writing in September of 23? Yeah. Wow. That's an yeah, impressive no, turnaround. It's insane. It's insane. Uh, look, luckily or unluckily at the moment, I am single. So it wasn't uh, upsetting anybody's uh, life too much. Sure. But yeah, I just kind of went m- mad. A little bit mad. A <laughs> little bit mad. Yeah. Uh, I, I made a huge list of all the things I wanted to cover because it's about children's ITV and specifically my love of children's ITV in the 80s and 90s, but giving it context before and after sort of thing. So it's not an. Because like, if I. If I'd written like a very detailed history, it would have taken forever, and it wouldn't have been that interesting. I don't think for me to go through think broadcasting from nineteen sixty four sort of thing. It's like people people want the hits a little bit, and also like something on like children's television going over serious with that sort of thing it's 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 deathly you can't you've got to have fun with it you've got to try and match the joy and sort of ex- interest of the thing you're talking about which you know, children's itv was definitely for me your newest released book uh, the dreams we had as children uh, a book that you wrote in three months apparently and yes, yes, yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> so I made the list, I, and then I found as much as I could, and then I watched as much as I could and made notes, and then tried to make those into actual 40 sort of decent mini essays. I mean, that that is pretty impressive, dude, I must, I must, I must say, because, um, I mean, I have had a, a flick through the book. I've read a, probably about half of it, you know, and, it, and it's come across as, as, a, as a nice, a nice, a nice read. You know, it doesn't yeah. feel rushed or anything or anything. And like, I learned a couple of bits, especially about how CITV came to be and or uh, and all the history behind the start yeah. of of all that kind of stuff. So, you, you did well, dude. I, I, you know what? I, I, it, when I say it out loud, when I say it took you know as long as it did, it's like it's yeah. Should it, I, I could have I, again. I, I stopped because there was a deadline with this one. I could have written and written and written and added more programs. And indeed, since sort of publishing the book, I have found a few shows. I'm like, ah, oh, damn! Wish I'd had, wish I'd put that in. I wish I'd remembered that. But I also have to go. This isn't an exhaustive thing. This is a personal sort of book. And like before this, I've written a few Christmas TV books, general one, and then an '80s one and a '90s one, and the only way I could really do those is because there's a story there, really, you know, which is the story of those decades. You know, in terms of like the eighties is not quite the boom. You know, we've sort of had the boom in the seventies of most watch telly, but it's still a huge decade for stuff on telly. You know, you know, programs like Only Fools and Horses suddenly becoming massive, and you know, the, the sort of the big film, how the films kind of moved on, you know, and became more recent and all that sort of stuff. And then the 90s, the story there is the sort of ending of all that, really. It's, you know, the rise of satellite TV and then digital and the internet and stuff. And it's kind of like the last gasp of, you know, there being some sort of, I won't say quality control, I won't say that. It implies that television (laughs) is rubbish now. And I'm not the sort of person who, even with the children's ITV book, I've I've got a recent thing, a recent show inspired it. And it's like, I'm not the sort of person who's like going, no, all old things are rubbish. But, you know, the, I can see there's, there's less joy. I think I'm going back to that word, joy. There's less joy on television. There's less, there's nothing really much that gives you that excitement. And that's why I think like Gladiators has done so well. The Return of Gladiators, yes. which I don't know if you've been watching it. I have. I I genuinely think it's great. I think oh, it's mate. because it's the same as the original. But pretty much, and like, or as enough as, well, yeah, uh, like I didn't know what to expect when we sat mm. down to watch episode one, and as soon as the titles came up and the music kicked in, and then it went to the arena, I was immediately transported like twenty yeah. years back in time yeah. to to when I watched it in the nineties, and it was amazing, not only because it felt like that to me, but also because I was watching it with my children, mm-hmm. and. Uh, something I thought I 
would never happen that I would be sitting down on a Saturday night at six o- six o'clock watching yeah. brand new Gladiators with my children. Yeah, it's amazing. But again, it, but it comes back to joy. It comes back to there is so little that you would sit and watch with your kids these days in that sort of scenario, you know, or uh, like like children's ITV again. The, the the shows that my parents would sit there and watch or like pretend they weren't watching but seriously be sort of sat on the corner of the sofa and that i just think those are more few and far between now and it's a shame every christmas comes along and we go right what's available all the stuff that does really well is light entertainment because that's what people want they want strictly and doctor who and the wheel or whatever yeah maybe less maybe less that one (laughs) It's true with like when you when you think about CITV and CBBC back in our day, because we had that time period where it was just for us. We knew we was gonna have a couple of you know it was it was it was, it was a nice thing to look forward to to get out of, uh, to get through your school day to know that yeah like, yeah that's I mean that's you absolutely back on yeah uh, a sort of this is our time this is our like hour and a bit of telly you know we claim this. Yeah. Not a thing like four till five thirty. So one of the things that came up with doing this as well is that people are going, yeah, but the kids don't want they don't want that. And like the CITV channel ended in September, which was a, a, the big impetus for me writing this. They're like, oh, people don't want it. It's like I get it. I one hundred percent understand that things have changed. Yeah, but I just feel there's something missing with that. I feel people aren't allowed to discover stuff anymore in the same way you know like flipping around what's this mm. as opposed to going around netflix 15 times yeah yeah and going oh maybe that maybe that that what's that uh, you know you don't you don't get that sort of stumbling on things that's what i think a lot of children's television is so beloved because of that i don't know if you necessarily would make an appointment for certain programs but you'd come home and you'd immediately put the telly on and it'd be like, right, what is it? Entertain me. You know, choice is a good thing to have. But I mean, I think we've got too much choice now that, that it does make it impossible to make a choice on what to watch sometimes. And it was nice back then to say, like, well, this is on. This is what you've got to choose from. You've got this or CBBC and that's yeah. it. And out of interest, I assume you flip between the two you know, for the best program. Mm-hmm which is correct which is the correct thing to do but i've heard people go nope they weren't allowed itv on or you know whatever it's 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 odd actually it's true because my my wife was a cbbc watcher her parents wouldn't let her watch citv because Mm. they didn't want her to see the adverts to to, okay to to, um you know for her to turn around and go i want this and i want that and this and the other that's the reason. really interesting. Yeah, I never thought about that because I mean, the, the the reason why, particularly, sort of eighty five to sort of ninety three, so sort of verdant with with program making and stuff, with all these things that are sort of being tried out and slightly riskier and like, animation and all that, is because the money's coming in through the animation uh, through the adverts, you know, mm-hmm. and you know when you have some programs like He Man, which literally are adverts for the toy you sort of thing yeah so yeah I, I get that but it's sort of a trade-off in those respects you know you really did have to go yeah there's some adverts here but it's paying for you know this series of whatever you know nightmare or yeah. danger mouse what struck me the most when i was reading your book was that like i don't know like growing up myself when looking back at this time period with, with the kids programs and cbbc and itv and like for some reason i always held that little bit more fondness for cbbc over itv yeah. for some reason and like the only yeah. the only thing i could think of that for that reason was probably the broom cupboard and like they seem to have this I, yes 100 uh, <clears throat> percent. yeah they got that right because ch- children's itv had hosts before bbc uh when it started in 1983 they did have on vision in vision horse but they were all pre-recorded and you know the beauty about the broom cupboard is it you know, they were reacting live to stuff and kind of like a pal almost familiar face 
like I said, when I read in your book, like, and how much I watched on, on CITV and I, it kind of reminded me of that. And I was like, Oh, do you know what? In fact, I probably watched more CITV and I probably enjoyed more of the programs from CITV than I did from BBC. I'll tell you something which has happened uh, in the sort of aftermath of this book is that people have said, well, uh, why isn't so-and-so in there? Someone said, why isn't uh, the Animals of Farthing Wood or uh, Demon Headmaster in there? And I said, because they weren't on ITV. You know, I think people, <laughs> as a kid, you just you sort of mush it all into one, you know, and that's fair enough. You, you don't really think, oh, I must watch the uh, BBC One immediately. You know, yeah. you just watch uh, whatever's wherever. Uh, so... I think you probably do have to look back like you did and go, oh, yeah, yeah. It was more of a spread than I realised. Mm. Even the cartoons, you know, obviously Danger Mouse, Count Docula, obviously some of the more, more famous cartoons that CITV yeah, yeah, showed. Yeah, from Cosgrove Hall, yeah. Uh, and, and that was a beautiful thing is because Cosgrove Hall was the animation department of Thames Television. And back then, of course, TV was in regions and so you had a lot of regions making stuff and sort of competing for getting in there which i think you know now we've got itv plc you know it's just drab it's all the same it's very formatted television these days there's no chance of anything possibly exciting happening you know in the same way as I'm going to say Noel's house party. I was going to say Noel's house party, and I thought, no, I don't want to be a Noel apologist. But, you know, this <laughs> certain type of live program. Because, you know, he did murder a man. That is that is, that is is a thing that happened. Uh, he did not personally, but he was he was heavily involved uh, with, with the death of a person. Uh, but, again, that wouldn't happen on Michael McIntyre's big show. No. Or... Uh, at the mass singer because they're pre-recorded yeah the problem more than anything is that this stuff isn't out there to watch again to to, to reinvestigate you know it's on youtube some of it in like pants quality you know mm-hmm. uh but and stuff like you know danger mouse has got full dvd releases and trapdoor and all that sort of stuff but there's loads of other stuff which hasn't like round the bend and gilbert's fridge nightmare uh, Palace Hill, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, it's sad that ITV don't seem to appreciate what they had. I might yeah. just be going depressing again. <laughs> well, it, it's hard, isn't it? I think if it wasn't if it wasn't for YouTube, then I think maybe things might have stayed the same. Because, you, think? My, you know, with my two children, they, they, you know, when they were little, little, little toddlers, you know, we watched CBeebies. Yeah, um, and they enjoyed that, but when they got to a certain age and they discovered YouTube, that was it. They would rather watch the random stuff that they could find on YouTube and not watch, you know, as in air quotes, the TV that I would watch when I was there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, that, totally. I mean, I was, you know, I was going out with someone with kids for quite a long time, and I saw that pattern also happen. Sort of moving away from CBBC to God, what were they called? They uh, people basically people play Minecraft. Mm-hmm. Or uh, yeah. doing silly dude perfect. That was it. I don't know if they're still a thing, but they were like, you know, oh, we're going to do this big prank or this big experiment sort of thing. And I, I get it. I do. Mm-hmm. I think uh, having what you want when you want is is a very exciting prospect, and it's certainly what I wanted as a kid. I wanted more options. You know, when I was younger, we got. Sky really early on. Well, it's a real. We got uh, Sky in August 1990. Wow, that uh, which is early. quite early for some. Not not if you're in Europe or what have you. But uh, because a guy we had, we had a business, someone came into business with a receiver and a dish and said, "Do you want to buy this for hundred quid?" <laughs> so, and my okay. dad went, yeah, "All right then," because you didn't. You only then did subscribe for films then. Yeah. So you know, yeah, we just that's true. Yeah, whatever, and it was like. Children's Channel, brilliant. I can't wait to watch this. And it ended at 10 a.m. every morning because it was all that transponder sharing crap. Yeah. So it was like, oh, now it's women's lifestyle program. Great. Well, I enjoyed that three hours of – it's like I want more. So I totally understand the uh, demand for more. I just feel there's, there's no 
sadness in having some options there, sort of thing, you know, having live television options. And I think yeah. rather than, as they're going to do, you know, CITV have done it and CBBC are going to do it, which is push everything onto digital. Yeah. And I think that'll, I think, I don't think that'll be a good move for them. I think part of what keeps people watching telly is because they still have people saying, send in your drawings, you know, send us this, send us that. You yeah. a hack of the dog, you know, lots of daftness and all that sort of stuff. And it's comforting. It's, again, it's back to the broom cupboard. But I, I appreciate that that's not where people in charge of television stations want television. I, I feel people who run television stations, television stations actively want them to fail. It's a bit stronger than intended, but I'll give you an example that I can think of and tell me to shut up at any point, obviously. <laughs> but the ghosts. Do you, do you watch Ghosts? The sitcom Ghosts just finished, obviously, on BBC One. Do you, do you watch that? Uh, I don't actually. Just to help you. You're aware of it, though. You're aware of it. Yeah, I know of it, yeah. Yeah, which means it's done its job, basically. It's been a successful sitcom. You know, people watch it, people are interested in it, and they announce the final series of it, and it's going to start on this day, and it's going to be a brilliant, you know, a a sitcom, because there's not a lot of them about these days at all. This last series is going to be a bit more emotional, a bit more dramatic, a bit more, you know, just something you want to watch, like water cooler moment kind of thing in a similar way and so the day it started on bbc one came and before even second of it had been on broadcast television it was all an iplayer and i just thought you just what well, why at least get the up you know normally they got watch the first episode then they'll put the series on and even that's a bit tacky uh, it's like the trailers, like they're doing that with the trailers and so people are in different places of where they're watching and it's like what are you doing hmm. Well, this is sort of, you've got these good programs that people want to talk about and enjoy, and you're kind of going, yeah, but enjoy them at different times. Yeah. And yeah, I find I find it all weird. You you miss that going into work the next day and go, oh, did you see the traitors last night? It was amazing, wasn't it? And you go, oh, oh no, no, I've watched them all now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now. yeah, oh, don't say I've not, I've not watched. You know, it's, it's impossible, really. And I feel... There's a place for that, and I appreciate I've gone way off the topic, but I, uh, I think there's a place for that, but I think people want live television. They want live light entertainment. They want sitcoms. They want variety, basically. Mm-hmm. And I think, again, I think that's where YouTube has come in and Twitch. I watch a lot of Twitch, mm-hmm. which for a 43-year-old man has probably seemed odd, but a lot of the people I watch don't necessarily do video games. Uh, you know, there's some people who'd like tech people as tech things apart and show you how we do it. Some are animators, you know. Uh, do you remember Badger, Badger, Badger? That cartoon from about 20 years ago and Weeble and Bob and stuff. Well, that guy has his own channel. You can watch him animate live. I'm like, that's brilliant. But it's an option. It's a, it's a secondary option of something and I like it because being on my own and working from home sometimes it's nice to know there's another live human being yeah you know around that's that's where kids tv really thrived because mm. let's say with CITV you got an hour and 15 minutes and in that there'd be a preschool program there'd be a cartoon There'd be a, sort of a, a serial, maybe, or a game show, or something like how to, you know, showing you how to make things and do stuff, and it fit a lot in. And you had people sort of hosting along with them eventually. Like live links came in eighty seven for a uh, children's ITV, but they, they they struggled to find the right sort of people really for fronting it. And I think they did really well with. Uh, Gene Downs and uh, Scally the dog uh, in the late eighties, but that that's that's a very weird thing. That basically, Central Television lost the license to make children's ITV, so an independent contractor came in and did all that, and and then they lost the contract again. And they brought Tommy Boyd in, safe, dependable Tommy Boyd, but not interesting, not exciting, not when you've got you know Ed the Duck on the other side, who 
he's a bastard. I will fully admit he's a bastard, but uh, <laughs> irritating sod. But it it were distracting. What well, I found funny, like where I was saying about my children just watch YouTube, was that when we go away, and like we stay at caravan, and we don't have, you just have free view. Yeah, yeah. And they'll still want to watch telly, so they will watch the BBC, and they used to watch the ITV, and they would actually yeah. enjoy it. And I would say, well, do you know what? You you can watch that at home if you want to. But mm-hmm. every time we come home, it is back to normal. Yeah. But I, I will give my youngest credit now. Uh, he has he has discovered Spider Man cartoons on Disney Plus, and he's now onto the Justice League. Oh, okay, I've not watched the Justice League ones, but I do like uh, I do love the ninety uh, superhero stuff, X Men, and all that. So it's, it's been quite nice to see him see him watch you know in air quotes again like normal <laughs> children's telly. Linear, I believe, is the phrase. Linear, uh, in that in that respect. But yeah, and I, I don't think kids should have to live by the ways that. Since again, it's a very it's a tightrope being going like things were good at this point, but I don't want to be the sort of person to tell people younger than me how to live their lives just because I had this thing, this mm-hmm. this service. Yeah, you you kind of want them to experience the same kind of. Ex- experience and magic that you did at their age but you can't force it onto them yeah it, it, do, it doesn't matter where it is but it's not on you i don't find it on youtube very much i don't think youtube is necessarily where youtube is not going to be a replacement for children's television no it's quite it's quite funny going into the front room sometimes and just seeing the absolute rubbish that they're watching like he'll, he'll be quite happy watching some person that's got two cuddly toys and are acting out a scene with those two cuddly toys in, in their bedroom or something and, you know it might be very good actually you know but it's just, it, when you when you walk in and just see that you go why aren't you watching danger mouse or something you know <laughs> i mean I, I sort of see the love in uh something that's just yours a show that you found which is yours uh which a lot of the programs in my book sort of were you know because you didn't know who was watching them necessarily other than kids in your school you know you didn't know how big things were so if you find a video like that and you think oh there's only a couple of thousand watch this you know this is my thing totally get that this stuff is great but it doesn't replace proper produced television for adults or children or families or whatever you know i think the gladiators thing has proved that eight million it got last week yeah yeah it was which good. when we were kids was no so that wouldn't get you in the top 20 programs no uh, but 14, now is 15 million yeah in our day is, is yeah it. but now is extremely good and that's gone up from week one mm. uh and i just think it proves if you give people something live that not only can they live tweet along with if they want uh, which I do enjoy, like, like with Top of the Pops repeats and stuff. It's in, it's fun to tweet along with those, taking the piss or in, in, you know, enjoying it sort of thing. Or with the people you're in the room with. Just like, I've watched the last two, I've gone round to my friend's house the last two weeks to watch it and we're like kids again. We're just like, whoa, yeah, you know, like. And we ended up watching Michael McIntyre after it and I'm not a big fan of Michael McIntyre. I don't hate him, I don't like him. He's, he's there sort of thing. But because it was on after and it, it was more light entertainment it was more light pro you know just but oh yeah all right we ended up watching that in in your uh citv book you obviously do a top 40 of your of your personal like favorite programs yeah from from citv through through very important thing to underline because there have been some reviews going uh Although there's one review I got for it on Abbott, he just said, well, I ain't heard of most of them, but he seemed to enjoy himself, so fair enough. <laughs> like, well, he's called CITV and me, yeah. you know, but... You know, and, you know, that's, that's interesting. There's programs in there I didn't, I couldn't remember or if I watched or whatever, and it was good to read about mm. those. Um, but, I mean, there were some omissions uh, from, from your top 40 that probably would have been in mine. Okay, uh, and so I've I've listed five of these programs, and I just wondered your reasons on Call why they didn't make lawyer, your top four. Get, get my lawyer on standby. <laughs> this is going to be libel. <laughs> this is going to be slander. Sorry, well, carry, carry on. Okay. I don't have a lawyer. <laughs> there, there's no legal action going to be taken against you 
through this. <laughs> Good luck. Just going to send some people around in case <laughs> yeah. I'm not happy yeah. with your reasons. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. My kneecaps are on uh, standby. <laughs> so the first program that I didn't notice in your top 40 was Funhouse. Why? Because it probably would be in my top 40 programs. There's not a lot to write about. It's the same thing every week, basically. It's the same form, which is why it was so good, you know, to be fair. But, I mean, it was the same every week hmm. for a decade, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, yeah. I can't find anything to really say about this. Uh, but I I fully concede, if this wasn't me write, having to find something to write about them, it would have been in there. Okay. All right, I'll let you off on that one. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> The second one is Button Moon. Uh, Button Moon, I, it's, I wasn't sure if it really came as a children's ITV program because it, it's, bef- it's before 1983 Button Moon started. The majority it? of it is on pre-children's uh, ITV and it was never shown in the afternoons. Was as it far ne- as when I could tell. Anyway, it was only at lunch, at lunchtime. You'll have watched it at lunchtime. 12.10. That was like the go-to uh, thing. But that didn't always like coincide with what children's itv had on and then later on basically they, you know they repeated what was on in the morning in the afternoon but i i'm fairly sure i looked into button moon and it didn't quite it didn't qualify enough for me and as i had a big old long list anyway i think i was i was probably looking for some things to sort of let let out uh of, of the of the list but I will, I will maintain that is one of the most beautiful pieces of music ever, that theme tune, and genuinely emotive in a way it really shouldn't be for a program about some reused washing up bottles and spoons. <laughs> yeah. I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that music in a long time. I'm, not singing, like should... I'm, not, I'm not singing it. <laughs> Damn it. Really okay. rough? No, no, not with my throat. <laughs> no, no. no. Not with the croaky throat. You need to rest it. Got radio shows today. The next program is probably the same answer that you gave me for Funhouse then, and that's Finders Keepers. Yeah, pretty much. I loved I I love I liked Finders Keepers more than Funhouse. Uh there's something more exciting about that kind of like almost you know, going through the drawers and stuff, doing all the stuff you can't do at home, you know, sort of digging through your mum's pants drawer and, you know, finding a clue, which is not what you'd find probably at home in in there and yeah i think there's more excitement from that but again the same sort of thing every week it did change slightly they brought jet in obviously we've been talking about gladiators they did bring diane udale in as a needless co-host uh later on in its run but other than that i think it's pretty same two more programs that i've chosen and the oh. first of those is super grand uh, Super Grand, yeah, was n- not really a children's ITV thing because it was a Sunday afternoon program. See, I can't remember these things when they were on. I just remember watching them on ITV. Well, that's it because I had to, I had to go back and sort of. I think that's been an issue with some people. Go, what about this? This? And it's like, it's. Uh, I don't think it went out under the CITV banner, basically, on because it was a Sunday afternoon program. I, again, I love that and another cracking theme tune, mm. uh, which Noisebox does have on the server. So that will come out occasionally if you listen Beautiful. to Noisebox. Nice. There's quite a few Billy Connolly songs on there actually, but yeah, sometimes Superground comes out and he just grin like an idiot. <laughs> uh, but Jenny McDade, who wrote Super Grand, went on to do Mr. Majika, who is in the book. And that was a children's uh, ITV thing, even though that jumped around. And it's probably much less rem- remembered, but it's a, it's, a, it's a cracking little series. Well worth uh If you remember Super Grand, that kind of like gentle anarchy sort of thing, you know, yeah. that's that's what Mr. Majika is too. And I was always surprised, like, um, the lady who played Super Grand. Um, Gudrun Earl. That's it. I, think, I don't know how you pronounce it, but yeah, something like that. I mean, she she was still alive until quite recently. I think she still is, isn't she? Is she? I don't see, and that amazed me. <laughs> I was like, well, that's either really good makeup in the program, or she just looked really old when she was young. Well, there is that. I mean, uh, good, good on her still with us. She's uh, oh, she's born in nineteen twenty six, so she was fifty nine when she started it. Uh, but so is Stanley Baxter, who played. Uh, Mr. Majika, he's still with us, thankfully. Wow. He is 
you know, I think we've celebrated him a little bit, but not nearly enough. He's 97 now. Wow. Stanley Baxter. And honestly, he needs parades in the street. He's yeah. such a great comedy actor. Go on then, bring your final one on. I feel like a politician. I've batted them all off so far. <laughs> you have. You've, you've yeah. been very um, smooth about it. Okay, well, this program was one of my f- all-time favourites. Like, I mean, you're probably going to tell me this probably wasn't on <laughs> CITV or something. But from my memory, this is this was on CITV during the week after yeah. school. And it was one of my favourite programmes. And it's one that always sticks in my brain. And I was slightly disappointed not to see it in your top 40. And that was woof. Now there you've got me. Now there I Woof was in the long list. It was in my it was in the top forty for a long time and it just got pushed out a little bit because it, it, again, there's not a lot to say about it really. But it's I watched series one again, I thought this is brilliant. And series one went out on Saturday afternoons. But it did eventually become sort of a weekday children's ITV thing. Yeah, did you know wrote it? I mean, well, certainly wrote no. the early series of it. No, uh, the writers called Fagan and Norris, and they'd done this sitcom called uh, Chance uh, in a Million, which is basically about the most unlucky man in the world. And then, at the same time as they're doing Wolf, they're writing the British Empire, oh, okay. which is so completely different. Yeah, yeah, it's baffling. So yes, Wolf should have been in there. Probably should have been in there, but then what comes out? I'll just be writing, and then he turns into a dog, and then he's got no clothes on, and then, <laughs> he's, and then he just gets some clothes, and he's a dog again. It's, you know, and the dog was called Pippin. We all remember that. <laughs> yeah, you've got me there. Hoisted, you have. Gotcha. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it was good. And that's a, that's a, that's um, like a great example. Like even just uh, Wolf and Super Gran of just some of the like quality original programming four children that we used to get that unfortunately probably won't be made now. And I think that is echoed by uh, Paul Rose, uh, Mr. Biffo, who, who did, who did a lot of like writing for children's TV and he doesn't do that anymore. I think he does a little bit, but not as much as he used to certainly with like four o'clock club and uh, it's not all sorts. I know he's done all sorts of uh, kids shows. I know four o'clock club was his main one uh, with Doc Brown. I, I think he's proved more than anyone that, even with the best talent in the world, if the money's not there, mm. it's it's going to be impossible. And I mean, I feel you had, you know, things, things ebb and flow. And I think probably Children's BBC did stagnate for a little bit. And then Steve Ride, who had been, you remember when Children's ITV went voiceover only, they got rid of all the presenters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was him. Okay. <laughs> and he was in... Uh, your mother won't like it and Palace Hill and stuff. Well, he, he became a, a, a big wig at the CBBC channel and he uh, brought in uh, Ed Petrie and Outcho the Cactus as uh, hosts. And have you ever seen any of this? No. Oh, you, you've got so much to enjoy. <laughs> Basically, Outcho doesn't speak English. He speaks Cactinian and only Ed can understand him. And he's a very angry cactus. <laughs> <laughs> and he's regularly calling Ed an idiot and uh, belittling him live on air. And it's just, they make this whole world around them. And the programs got better. They, they did, uh, there's Raven, the uh, sort of games, well, that had been before, but it's like, uh, what else was there? There was the Legend of Dick and Dom eventually. And uh, there was a program called, what was it? Oh, God, I can't it had uh, basically playing old TV clips. Uh, Shaft was it called Shaft? Yeah, something like that. And and then they had the 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 Slammer, which was the sort of like Ted Robbins as a governor of a light entertainment jail, and people did acts to try to to, to get parole and stuff. And that. it just it got more, a lot more fun. And I think they've sort of they've kept they've kept as much as they can of that, but the budgets have been slashed constantly. Mm. You know, and they haven't. I, I, th- th- there must be commercial things to back up. I mean, like CBeebies is a gold mine, but that's because they, you know, they make fantastic programs. I think we're coming back to the thing. I think I think BBC don't understand what they have in both archive and current programming for children. Yeah, you know, and I genuinely think 
it's a, it's a really daft thing, and people have said this for years. You know, people have always had these fantasy things about, oh, if they just had a CITV streaming service playing old stuff. And, you know, the, I mean, part of what I've learned in this book is that there are companies, the one in particular, TVS, went under. Uh, it lost its franchise, and so it got bought up in bits, and all those programs now, through a, a bizarre array of events, uh, now owned by Disney. And I can't see Disney Plus rushing to put uh, old episodes of All Clued Up <laughs> on Disney Plus. Or, I mean, stuff like Mr. Majika and that. You know, they, just, they won't know what they own, yeah. really, I suspect. Yeah. So it would be lovely to have an archive kids TV channel. And I think it'd do all right. Yeah. As, as I learned with this book, there are so many eras. There are so many eras of kids TV. And everyone thinks every other era was rubbish, <laughs> you know, but not as good as mine anyway, you know, sort of thing. And for me, I would say the golden period, definitely, sort of between 88 and 91. I think they had a lot of money, they had a lot of creative, interesting programmes, and they were probably making a fortune as well. I say it's, the, it's when the money's not coming in, you know, well, before you go, Ben, I just wanted to just check with you. You know, what's next for you? Have you got an idea for another book, or or is that it for now? I am going to have a long sleep. No, I, I do <laughs> have an idea for a book, and it's it's yeah, it's currently in the research process, which basically means not doing it in three bloody months. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of going through the British new newspaper archive and stuff. It's it it's it might it might be something it might not, but I'm generally better with a uh, with a project on the go, mm -hmm. and I've got the two radio programs and the podcast. Yeah. Which I wish I could tell you what it is. It's nobody should do a podcast on this subject. <laughs> okay, well that's very intriguing. So we'll uh, I we'll definitely have to uh, make make sure everyone knows about it when it. Well, when once it it's out. launched, we'll we'll come back on me and my co-host because okay. it fits very much in your world. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I look forward to it then. Cool. Um, well, before you go, Ben, can you just tell everybody where they can go to find your books and go and listen to you and whatever else? Just bushes look for them in there. Generally, it's like tattered old copies might be in there. No, you can go to Linktree, which is linktr.ee slash Ben Baker Books. And that's got links to my books on Lulu for Kindle. All, all my stuff is on there. And there's links to Noisebox Radio. You'll find me, you can find my Blue Sky on there. And uh, I've got a Patreon should people want to have out to do with that as well. So, yeah, yes, yeah, all the links are there. So just look for just look for Ben Baker, the internet, uh, Woodlane, NW1. So, <laughs> good good yeah. memory there, dude. But yeah, uh, easy peasy. Yeah, to get to his uh, link tree uh, to find all his stuff. But Ben, thank you so much for joining me. It was a great conversation and uh, pleasure having you here, mate. I look forward to you to edit it to 20 minutes of things <laughs> that are basically not just me ranting against the modern world. <laughs> um, uh, I might leave it all in, you know. They're just two uh, middle aged old men ranting about shit, you know. Yeah. Oh, look, there's a cloud. I'm going to rant it. <laughs> thank but, you for having me no it's been it's been a pleasure dude yeah i look forward to uh experiencing the uh the stuff that you are you are producing it sounds a very weird and dodgy sentence but uh <laughs> that's that covers it yeah weird it, and dodgy. That pretty much covers it yeah yeah listeners as always thank you for your company and we will hopefully see you again in a couple of weeks time so you all take care out there bye bye oh. <laughs>